Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MedSynapse podcast series. I'm your host, Dr. Nigar, and today we're going to dive into the world of dermatology. In today's episode, we will be going deep into the skin condition that affects a lot of people, rosacea. And to shed light on this topic, we're honored to have a distinguished guest with us, Dr. Ian Webster, a renowned specialist dermatologist coming from Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. Ian Webster is a true pioneer in his field and he was the first to introduce skin lasers to South Africa and established the first dedicated skin laser clinic in Cape Town in the 90s. He's also the co-founder and director of Dermastore, South Africa's first online cosmetic skincare store. Dr. Ian Webster specializes in medical, surgical, and cosmetic dermatology. He is the director at Derma Laser Medical Skin and Laser Clinic in Somerset West, working alongside with esteemed colleagues. Welcome, Dr. Ian. No, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, Dr. Nigel. Thank you so much. Now, without further delay, let's begin with our discussion. To begin with, we know that skin conditions can often be challenging to differentiate. Dr. In. Could you please provide a brief overview of rosacea for our audience of doctors, including the common signs and symptoms that help distinguish it from other skin conditions? So rosacea is a common inflammatory condition. Uh, it affects about 5% of the population and it, it involves the central part of the face. And the symptoms are flushing. There might be stinging of the skin. Uh, there was often little red bumps, little papules and pustules, and there's often little broken capillaries. Now, understanding who is most commonly affected by rosacea is crucial for diagnosis and treatment. Are there any demographic trends or risk factors that doctors should be aware of? So it tends to occur mainly in women over the age of 30, and it tends to occur in women with a lighter complexion, often of Celtic origin. Uh, there is often a genetic predisposition and it is more common in women that smoke. The development of rosacea involves various factors. Could you please explain the underlying pathophysiology of rosacea and how genetics and environmental factors triggers contribute to its development? So the pathology is complex and multifactorial. As you mentioned, <clears throat> genetic factors play a role. Um, persons with rosacea have what we call vasomotor instability. In other words, to various environmental factors, the blood vessels tend to open and close more rapidly and you often will get this flushing and blushing. Uh, in addition to that, recent research has also shown that the loss of barrier function is very important in rosacea. So many uh, skin diseases now, like atopic eczema, psoriasis, there's a, uh, more research going into barrier function. So with rosacea, you also have impaired barrier function and that uh, can affect the pathogenesis of rosacea. The other thing is demodex mite. People with rosacea have more of the naturally occurring mite called demodex on their skin and uh, we don't know whether it's a sort of chicken or egg, but certainly we can, um, there are therapeutic modalities like ivermectin uh, that is useful for treating rosacea. Moving on, rosacea isn't a one-size-fits-all condition. To help doctors make informed decisions, could you please walk us through the different clinical subtypes of rosacea and their characteristic features? Like, how does recognizing these subtypes guide treatment decisions? So, the, the, the classic, uh, there are classic four subtypes that have been described in most of the textbooks. Number one, it is the erythrotelangiectatic rosacea, or ETR, and that is where you get um, transient and permanent redness of the skin, and you get telangiectasia. The number two is the papular pustular rosacea, and that is where you also get erythema of the central face, but you also get lots of little 
small little red papules and pustules. Uh, the other type is the phimatous rosacea, is where you get thickening the skin. The sebaceous glands get thicker and you get thickening of the skin. This tends to occur more in males, especially on the nose where you can get what we call rhinophyma. And the other type is what we call ocular rosacea. The, the rosacea can affect the, uh, the eyes and often you get like a grittiness. It feels like a foreign body in your eye and you get conjunctival injection. So those are the four classic subtypes. Um, a lot of my colleagues or professors have questioned whether those are useful as far as therapeutics. And they're, and they're now saying rather, I can maybe explain that later, use the more phenotypic description for, um, for, treatment, for treatment options. Now, skin conditions with overlapping symptoms can be very tricky to diagnose. How did doctors differentiate rosacea from conditions like acne or lupus, especially in cases where symptoms may appear very similar? Yes, so <clears throat> acne, uh, often, as you know, it presents with little, little papules and pustules. But the difference is with rosacea, you don't get comedones. You don't get comedones. So in acne, you're going to get seborrhea, comedones, papules, pustules. You might get deeper lesions. You might get nodules and cysts. You might get post-inflammatory pigmentation, and it'll, you'll often get scarring as well. And the distribution of acne is slightly different. So that's the, the, the usual way of differentiating. But the key, the key uh, symptom or sign to look at with rosacea, you don't get comedones. So if you see the papules and pustules, but no comedones, then you know it's rosacea and not acne. But some patients will have acne as well as rosacea, and that makes it a little bit more tricky, but we can maybe talk about that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> lupus, acute uh, cutaneous lupus, it's often a butterfly rash. It's often might be a little bit red and scaly, but acute cutaneous lupus, the patient is sick. You know, they have joint pains, fever. Uh, so that's usually pretty easy to differentiate from that. The other thing is perioral dermatitis. You get the same little papules and pustules around the mouth. Um, and the other name for it, there's another name, is periorificial dermatitis, where you get the little red papules and pustules around the mouth, but it can also occur around the nose and around the eyes. And that um, is similar to rosacea, but it's often triggered by the use of potent topical steroids. So those patients have often used a potent topical steroid to those areas and they get this uh, uh, periorificial dermatitis. But the treatment is actually quite similar to rosacea. Now, moving on to our next question, what are the current guidelines for treating rosacea and how do treatment strategies differ based on clinical subtypes and severity of the condition? So number one, I think it's very important when, once you make the diagnosis of rosacea, as it's often the patients are misdiagnosed as having acne, you know, so they don't know that they've got rosacea. So I think what's very important is to sit down with the patient and explain to them what rosacea is and <clears throat> explain to them that it's a, it's a chronic relapsing condition and that <clears throat> the, the, the number of trigger factors, and I think you need to go through all the trigger factors. So basically, anything that causes your face to go red will make rosacea worse, like extremes of heat and cold, spicy foods, alcohol. So you need to go through in detail with them and explain to them what the trigger factors are. And the other important thing is for you to um, explain to them about using skincare products, because people with rosacea have a more sensitive skin so you need to use the very uh, the gentler skincare products. Uh, the brand that I quite like recommending is the Bioderma Sensibio range. It's for it's for people with a more sensitive skin. So you want to use a very mild, like gentle cleanser, like a cream cleanser, and very uh, a very gentle products. That's important. Okay, and then, so what I'll, what I'll maybe now do, sorry, we can maybe cut, cut this bit out. I'll go on to more the, 
the phenotype treatment guidelines, uh, which is slightly different than original classification. So um, we had our annual dermatology congress in Cape Town, South Africa, about a month ago. And a Dr. Jerry Tan, he's a, a famous dermatologist from Canada, gave us a talk on rosacea and he um, explained these phenotype treatment guidelines, which I thought were quite good. So number one, <clears throat> it's more the, the symptom or the sign, the treating the symptom or the sign, like the transient erythema or flushing. If it's mild, it doesn't need any treatment. If it's more severe, you can consider giving oral beta blockers. I personally don't do it myself, but this is what he mentioned in his talk, which I thought was good. And then you get persistent erythema where the, the erythema is fixed. Um, again, if it's mild, you, you don't have to treat it at all. But if it is more severe, um, you can consider doing topical alpha adrenergic agents uh, like uh, rim, rimonidine. Uh, that product is not registered in South Africa, so I have no experience with using it, um, but certainly it is registered overseas. And again, you can do give beta blockers orally, it's off-label use, but I personally don't do that, but it, uh, Dr. Tan did mention this. And the other thing, you can use energy-based devices like IPL, that's a treatment I like a lot. Um, so for the fixed erythema, you can use uh, intense pulse light. And then the next is the papules and the pustules. <clears throat> so if you see the little red papules and the pustules, there's inflammation of the skin. And what I really like uh, is topical ivermectin. So ivermectin obviously works against the demodex mite. Uh, the trade name is called cilantro throughout most of the world. It's only been in South Africa for about 18 months, but we're getting fantastic results with it. So it's a cream that's used at night time. So it works against the demodex mite, but it's also got anti-inflammatory properties and uh, we're getting fantastic results with that. The other thing is uh, metronidazole gel. It's only available in a gel and certainly in South Africa with a trade name Rosex. I think that's over most of the world. Uh, <clears throat> so again, that's got anti-inflammatory properties. That's been on the market in South Africa for quite a long time, but I find, and I think clinical studies have also shown that, that the uh, ivermectin works better than the metronidazole gel. And basically I'm changing most of my patients that were using metronidazole uh, to ivermectin gel. The other topical agent that you can use for the papula, papules and pustules is uh, azelaic acid, uh, trade name in South Africa, Skinnerin, um, and that uh, certainly can help. I find it doesn't work quite as well as the um, as the ivermectin, but in my opinion, ivermectin cream has been a major improvement on the topical treatments. And then if the papules and pustules are more severe, then you can go with the oral tetracyclines. <clears throat> uh, I prefer one called lime cycling, trade name tetralysol made by Galderma. I prefer that tetracycline because it doesn't cause photosensitivity and it doesn't cause GRT uh, upsets like doxycycline. I virtually never prescribe doxycycline anymore. It is a bit cheaper, uh, but I find um, uh, Lyme cycling uh, well tolerated and works extremely well. Um, and the other product you can use for the papules and pustules is isotretinoin, but you use it at a low dose. Um, you use it at about 2.2 milligrams per kilo. Um, that's if the, if the previous treatments have failed. Uh, and again, for the telangic tase, if you've got the little broken veins, the energy-based devices like IPL works very, very well. Um, so a lot of these treatments will help for the inflammatory component, but obviously won't take away the telangic tase. And that's where IPL, which is a thing I specialize in, works extremely well and that produces a cosmetic improvement. And then for the phimatis, for the thickening of the skin, in the early stages you can use isotretinoin again. 
at a dosage from about 0.3 to 1 milligram per kilo um, in the early stages. The late stages of the phimetus changes, you often do need laser surgery or just normal surgery, uh, say to debulk the nodes if you've got rhinophyma. And then ocular rosacea, <clears throat> uh, often we see it with our patients. If they've got uh, skin rosacea, you can see the eyes are red and gritty. And often if you're going to be treating them with oral tetracyclines, you know that the, 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 eye res the ocular rosacea will also improve. But you do need to use eye lubricants. Um, but the treatment, I generally don't refer immediately to an ophthalmologist if I'm already giving oral tetracyclines because I know the, the ocularization is going to improve with that. But if it's not responding as expected and the ocularization is more, more severe, then I, then I do tend to refer to an ophthalmologist. Now, staying up to date with the latest research is also very important. Are there any promising emerging therapies or research trends in rosacea treatment that fellow doctors should be aware of? So as I mentioned before, uh, barrier function is very important, um, is to preserve your barrier function. So if you can preserve your barrier function and repair your barrier function, it makes the rosacea easier to manage. There have been some newer therapies offered, offered for the persistent erythema. There is the um, antidepressant paroxetine, uh, trade name Arapax that uh, was presented recently at the World Congress of Dermatology in Singapore where that seems to help for the persistent stubborn erythema that it is obviously off-label use um, and it has got a number of side effects but that is something to consider um, the antidepressant uh, paroxetine. Now some cases require combination therapies in such situations, how do dermatologists decide on the best combinations? And could you please provide examples of these effective combinations? Okay, so as I explained previously, sometimes you get acne as well as rosacea, the two conditions occurring together. And that's where uh, products like azelaic acid is very useful because azelaic acid helps for acne as well as rosacea. So you can use that topically. Oral tetracyclines will help for the rosacea and the acne. And isotretinoin the same. Isotretinoin will help, help for the rosacea as well as the acne. But obviously for rosacea, if it's mainly rosacea, you just give much uh, a, a much lower dose. Um, and often you will see with rosacea, you will see the patients have seborrheic dermatitis as well as rosacea and that's where again as a lake acid which is available either in a cream or a gel is very useful because you'll be covering you'll be covering the both options um, and then often what i do as i said i've been very impressed with ivermectin cream so um, often if the patient's got a dry skin the ivermectin only needs to be given or is recommended only used at night time so sometimes what I will do is prescribe ivermectin cream at night time and metronidazole cream in the morning. And I find that combination works, works very nicely. Um, and what I'm finding with ivermectin, with that combination, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm finding that I'm prescribing less oral tetracyclines. So basically what you want to do, because rosacea is a chronic relapsing condition, you want to try and control it just on topical treatment. You want to try and avoid the oral tetracyclines, try and avoid the, the isotretinoin where possible. So if you can control it on, on topical, uh, on, uh, on uh, get, uh, limiting the trigger factors, on good skin care, and just on topical treatments, then that is a win-win situation. And I think that's why sitting down, talking to your patient, educating your patient uh, that they must understand what they've got to do. And, and often as far as the, uh, the flushing, I always say to my patients, you must still continue your life. You must still do exercise. 
Uh, I mean, you can have a bit of alcohol if you want to, but you do have to modify your lifestyle to a certain degree, you know. But you want to try and control it with the uh, with the safest products possible, and preferably not oral tetracyclines or isotretinoin. Now let's move on to our final question of the day on ocular rosacea. Ocular rosacea is a common complication that demands specialized care. How did dermatologists collaborate with ophthalmologists to effectively manage cases of ocular rosacea? So if I've got a patient that's got obvious uh, rosacea on the face and they are complaining of red, gritty eyes, uh, then and the, the rosacea on the face is more severe, I will often put them onto good topical treatment as well as oral tetracyclines. And then you know that they are going to respond. But you do need to also explain to them about good lid or eye hygiene. Often we use a product called Navibleft gel. Um, and you often need to use eye lubricants. So in the beginning, if they are on oral tetracyclines, I, will, I personally do not refer them immediately to an ophthalmologist. Uh, but once I wean them off the oral tetracyclines, and if the eyes are still a problem, then I will refer uh, my patients to ophthalmologists because ocular rosacea left untreated, you know, can cause quite severe like corneal abrasions and, you know, quite severe ocular complications. So I often do, I do work closely with my uh, ophthalmology colleagues. Dr. Webster, we would like to extend our sincere gratitude for your time and for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today on this very important topic. No, it's a pleasure. I hope it, um, so my voice is a bit hoarse, at least I don't think I've coughed actually. But, um, I hope you have gained something by it, um, that, it, that, it that I'm happy with it, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Webster, once again, and we're looking forward to many more podcasts together in the future. And to our audience on MedSynapse, thank you so much for joining us today. If you found this discussion to be informative and want to stay updated on more medical insights like this, don't forget to like, subscribe, and register on our MedSynapse platform. Your support helps us to continue to bring valuable content. Thank you so much and see you soon. Goodbye.